Our CPU is already able to execute simple programs that consist almost entirely of chump and no op instructions. In the middle of the build, there are two breadboards that make up the program counter, which tells the CPU where in the program it currently is and allows it to jump about. Now seems like a good time to replace these breadboards with a proper PCB and get rid of some of the clutter. It's also a great opportunity to expand the program counter from 8 bits to 16 bits, such that we can address 64 kilobytes of memory instead of just 256 bytes. Be sure to like and subscribe if you want to see this project unfold. So to get started, uh, let's create a schematic of the program counter PCB. So the core component of the program counter arguably is the register that actually stores the current um, address inside the program. And this was implemented on the um, breadboard with a 74HC377 chip. Um, so let's start out with that. So one thing we're going to change in comparison to the breadboard, we're actually going to make this PCB uh, 16 bits. So instead of just one of these 8-bit registers, we are going to have two of them um, to store the full 16 bits of address. The data inputs here, they're actually coming from this large multiplexer that we have on the program counter breadboard at the moment. So let me add this 74HC153 multiplexer chip. And um, these four-way multiplexers, they have uh, two parallel multiplexers in one package. So because we have 16 bits, we need uh, a total of eight of these chips. Okay, next up, uh, we have this enable line here. So this thing we could call something like uh, register or mux enable. And again, it's uh, uh, an inverted signal. So we'll add this uh, hashtag thingy to indicate that. And next up, we have the select lines, which is basically the A and B inputs here, uh, which again will just cross connect across all the multiplexers, uh, because this is basically dictating which input we're selecting to be fed through to the output. So B is the second bit. So this is um, select one. And A is the lower bit. So this is going to be select zero then uh, we were only using the first three inputs of these multiplexers. So these were um, just stepping to the next instruction, which was input zero, uh, performing a relative jump, which was input one, and performing an absolute jump, which was uh, input two. And maybe now is a good time to actually change things around a bit and make it a bit more clean by uh, connecting this multiplexer enable and turning this into an actual uh, bus connection like this. All right, so let's actually start hooking up some of the bits. And let's maybe start with the uh, output bits here. Let's call this PC next zero, which is basically bit zero of the next program counter address. All right, next up, let's um, do the um, step address, which is basically the uh, input number zero, which is the address of the next instruction, if we were to just step ahead to the next instruction. Then next up, uh, input number one is the um, relative address. So like the address of the relative jump target. All right. And finally, um, there's also the absolute address, which is the um, absolute jump target, which is provided from uh, off the program counter board. This is going to come from some register later on. Uh, so we can do uh, absolute jumps. There's going to be a lot of wires to route on that PCB. So that's everything about the multiplexers wired up. Let me briefly um, change the name of them. So the um, silk screen is going to be easier to read. And now while we're at it and, and we're right here, let's actually do the same for the register and let's wire up a default order in a sense for the bits. Then for the select uh, inputs, we want to have LEDs to visualize what the current mode is that we're selecting on the program counter. So let me add that. We want to be able to look at the current state of the program counter, what the current value is in the program counter. So basically what we want is 16 LEDs to show whatever's in the register. And we'll use, I think, red LEDs for these to kind of indicate what the current status is. We'll also want a resistor array for these. 
All right, so that's the um, bits all wired up. So these LEDs will basically show us where we are in the program at the current point in time. And while we're at it, we might hook up the uh, reset logic to the register now that we have it. So we want 74HC00 chips. And that's also a good point to go in and add an LED for the register enable here, because we want to see from the outside if the program counter is actually enabled and the register is going to update in the next cycle. Now there's two other things that the um, program counter is doing. It has to actually do the counting. So basically what we need to do is compute the step address and the relative jump address. Um, so let's start with the step address, which is basically taking the current program counter value and computing the, um, well, next instructions uh, address. And on the breadboard, we used a 74HC283 chip, which is a 4-bit binary adder. And we're going to use the same chip again. Um, but on the breadboard, we had uh, two of those because we were only dealing with 8-bit numbers. But now here for the PCB, we want uh, four of those. So we can do uh, an addition on the full 16 bits of the program counter. Next up, what's uh, left to do is hook up the carry chain of these adders. Um, so this first adder is producing a carry output here that we do need to uh, wire back up to the carry input of the next adder. And then last but not least, there's the carry input of the very first adder in the chain. And as we discussed, this is just going to be VCC. Uh, so we set this to high. So we always at least add a one to the current program counter to be incremented to uh, two, three or four, depending on whatever the step size is currently uh, configured to. So we can use a uh, jumper to actually selectively disconnect um, PC0 and PC1 from the adder here on uh, the actual PCB. So we might want to add a comment here um, just to kind of indicate what is going on. And this will allow us to do um, pretty fancy instruction fetching behavior for very complicated instruction issuing setups just by using uh, two resistors and two jumpers. So that's going to be pretty neat. All right, so this concludes the computation of the um, step address, which is whatever the address of the next instruction is going to be. Now there's a second set of adders we need, and that is to compute the um, relative jump offset. Again, as we did on the uh, left side here, uh, let's wire up the outputs of the adders, which in this case is going to provide the relative address. So the target address for a relative jump. Now, how do we compute this? On the one hand, we need to have a chump base address, which is basically where do we chump from? And to that, we add a relative offset, basically indicating how much forward or backwards we want to chump given that base address. Instead of just connecting PC0, we will actually uh, call this relative base zero, which is um, the base address of the relative chump. And we will hook that up to input A of the adders here. Uh, I also realized that there's uh, we still have this carry input here of the first adder. And in contrast to the step address calculation, we want to tie this to zero. So we're not adding on top of the actual uh, relative jump offset. All right, so that's one side of the addition done. And the other half will be a relative jump offset. However, that uh, relative uh, jump offset will be decoded from the instruction and is likely to never going to be larger than eight bits. So here's going to be the rel offset zero, and this is going to be the B input. All right, um, but now in a sense, we've run out of relative offset bits because it's only an 8-bit number. So what do we do with the, um, with the upper 8 bits? One natural option and one natural thing to do is just to zero extend, which means we fill in the uh, upper bit with a zero. And what that would do is it would basically allow us to add any value from zero to 255 to the current program counter value. However, we also want to be able to jump backwards. So starting at the current relative base, we want to be able to subtract a value this is useful for loops, for example, which tend to jump backwards and uh, kind of like close a loop around a section of code. And the way to do this is instead of doing zero extension, we can do sine extension, which basically means we take the highest bit of the value that we do have, which is bit seven uh, of the relative offset, and 
we just replicate bit 7 on all the upper bits. Sign extension and zero extension are very common operations. If you have fewer bits available than your actual operation or computation needs, uh, and it allows you to basically increase the size of these values and, and treat them accordingly, depending on whether you want them to be unsigned, in which case you would use zero padding or signed, uh, in which case you would be uh, sign extending those values. Now that's basically the relative chump uh, target address computation all set up. The thing we need to take care of now is what do we do with this relative base address here? And I think the easiest thing to do is actually take one of these resistor networks and use those as a jumper. On the left hand side, we will have the actual program counter. And then on the right hand side, we will have the relative base address. Now this might not seem like it's doing all that much, but we can have a pin header which connects to this relative base address that leads off the PCB. And when we leave the pin header unconnected, this resistor here will pull the relative base address to be the same value as the current program counter value. But when we actually do hook up those uh, external connections, we can override the values provided by the program counter and just drive them and force them to be a specific value because we can easily overpower this 100 kilo ohm resistor. All right, and that's also a good moment in time to introduce our first pin header just to carry this relative base off the PCB. And this will be the rel base uh, jumper. And while we're at it, we also want to have um, the current PC value presented off the board. All right, so that's two jumpers going off the PCB, already done. We also have this relative offset that we want to configure. And this is going to be an 8-bit value. This is going to be the rel offset. So this gives us all we need to control the relative jumping behavior of the um, program counter by giving us the opportunity to override the relative jump base address, configuring the relative jump offset. This might just come from an instruction, which is the likely case. And we also produce the, uh, the state of the current program counter. Now, if you recall, we also want to be able to look at the next instruction address outside of the program counter's PCB. This is useful for things like function calls, where we also want to keep the return address around, and that return address will be the instruction after the function call that we're doing. So this is going to be the step address. And actually, while we're at it, um, we can also uh, add a header for the absolute jump address. Now it's also good to keep in mind that the program counter is kind of going to be the odd one among the PCBs of the CPU uh, because it's specifically dealing with 16-bit values. Um, the remainder of the CPU is going to be 8 bits, and so all these like 16-fold replications of wires are going to be much easier to deal with because it's only going to be packets of 8 bits in, in the rest of the CPU. But here for the program counter, because we want to have a little bit of memory available for execution, we'll have to deal with the full 16-bit address space. Things that are currently missing um, that we need to add still are some of the control signals. So for one, we want to have um, power ground connectors. And then on top of that, we have a few uh, control signals that we need to um, provide from outside the PCB. Um, so this is going to be the select input for one to basically choose what the program counter is supposed to be doing. Um, it's going to be the enable signal and the reset signal that control the rough behavior of, uh, of the program counter. Um, and it's going to be the uh, clock that's going to come from outside as well. And we'll just add in a ground connection there. So this is the control input, and this should drive the clock reset, enable the two selects, and the step sizes. And uh, we might want to just move things around a bit and have this be a bit more compact. What's left to add are the caps. Uh, 0603 looks good. And we will have 10 microfarads as the main decoupling caps that we hook up directly to these power connectors and kind of try to keep close to them just to provide some decoupling. 
and then we need decoupling caps for all the integrated circuits we have. So that's 18 caps. So that's going to be a 100 nanofarad capacitor. All right, and possibly add a document thing. Just do something like this, and then we will change the size of this accordingly. So this is the program counter version one. Let me add the uh, open hardware logo. So let's give this a check. So none of the nets complain and they all seem to be wired up. Now let's maybe document what the rel base situation is down here. So all that's left to do is actually uh, arrange this on the actual PCB and come up with a layout that is going to work and that we can actually manufacture and then assemble. And then we can get rid of the um, breadboard version of this and have a more robust and uh, more importantly, 16-bit version of the program counter up and running, which is going to be great. So for starters, let me copy-paste the design rules that JLC PCB has into the layout editor. And then we want to do a rough layout of the pin headers of the PCB, because this is what's going to uh, carry signals on and off the PCB and needs to plug into a backplane or other breadboards. So it's good to get this figured out early on, and then we can arrange the integrated circuits in between the pin headers. So as a first step, let's get something very simple and regular out of the way. Uh, for example, the program counter LEDs, which just show the current state of the program counter. Um, these are likely going to be placed pretty close to the program counter header. Um, so uh, let me pull these things together and arrange them in a neat line. Um, and then also pull up the uh, resistor networks that uh, currently limits the LEDs. And then we'll see how we can arrange them neatly around the program counter header. Then let me move up the two register chips that actually hold the current program counter value. Um, let's move it closer to the LEDs and the PC header we have. Now the next big chunk of chips are the multiplexers. We have eight of them. Uh, so let's uh, group them up a bit and let's see if we can figure out how to roughly connect them to the program counter registers and the uh, input headers. I'll also want to turn these uh, top headers around such that the least significant bit is on the right hand side. Now to get a better idea of how things connect up to the multiplexers, let's actually group up the adder chips we have. We have two 16-bit adders, so that's two groups of four chips each. So let's bring them closer together such that we can see the connections that they make to the multiplexers and we can figure out a rough layout on the PCB on where to put them. Uh, let's bring the AND gate that drives the reset logic closer to the control inputs. And let me also arrange the status LEDs uh, close to the reset logic and close to the control inputs. Now let me bring up these uh, caps and resistors and jumpers a bit. And let me doodle around with the chips a bit to uh, see if there's a good arrangement for them. And we might actually have an easier time laying out the uh, LEDs if we move the resistor networks to the bottom side of the PCB. I think what we'll want to do is actually swap these pin headers at the top around such that the absolute address is on the left and the relative base is on the right. Um, because that allows us to move the multiplexer to the left of the PCB where it isn't in the way of the uh, program counter register chips as much. Nice, this uh, new arrangement for the multiplexer has opened up uh, some space up here for the reset logic and the status LEDs. To plan ahead for the signal routing, let me create a few short wire segments in a kind of bus arrangement for the signals that make up the current program counter value. 
the current program counter value also needs to uh, go from the register chips to the adder just right above them. So let me actually copy um, this bus we've created up there. And this will allow us to see how the actual signals flow. And as you can see, the resistor networks we have there are sort of in the wrong order. Uh, so let me actually flip these resistors around, which will make routing a lot easier. Let's add a first outline to the board and pump the headers around a bit. And then I think it's a good idea to focus on the relative jump address computation a bit. To get started, let me actually create uh, such a wire bundle for the relative address bus that will go from the adders on the right to the multiplexer on the left, so we can get a rough idea of how the signals will flow. Let's refine the placement of the adders a bit. Time to get started on some signal routing. Let me try to route some of the signals from the adders to the header right above them. We might actually have an easier time if we rotated the adders by 90 degrees. That looks a lot cleaner. Uh, let me copy this over to the other three adders. And let's maybe plan the relative address bus um, at the bottom of the adders a bit. And now is as good a time as ever to uh, wire the adders up to the relative base and the relative offset headers at the top. Let's do a similar thing for the adders that compute the uh, step address. First, figure out a general way of breaking out the wires from underneath uh, one of the adders. Bring up the jumpers related to the step address computation. And then copy over the breakout wiring to the uh, other adder chips. Let me bring the step address header a bit closer and then actually route the current PC value bus to the adders. Now PC bits uh, 0 and 1 need some special treatment because they have these special round down jumpers. Next up, I'd like to wire the result of the adder up to the step address header so that that is out of the way. And then let me break out the uh, step size input of the adder and hook up the carry chain of the uh, step adder. Time to focus on the multiplexer at the top of the PCB. Let me first arrange the MUX chips a bit more carefully. Let me see if I can uh, rework the placement of the chips a bit based on the bus stub wires we have on the right hand side, just to make uh, routing easier. Let's get some of the routes underneath the uh, multiplexer going. Let's do this by bringing the data buses to the sides. And I think some of the stuff has to go on the bottom layer because there's just too many wires here to route them all on the top layer. Next, let's do the uh, select and enable lines of the lower half of the multiplexers. And on the bottom layer, let's bring in the PC next and relative address buses for the lower half. And then for the uh, upper half of the multiplexer chips, uh, let's start out with the select and enable lines again. And then move on to the PC next and relative address buses. And finally, we'll want to bring in the signals from the absolute address header.
Let me try to find a more concrete placement for the LEDs and also add uh, labels to them so we know uh, what each LED uh, is supposed to indicate. I'm also going to move around the uh, headers and the uh, associated groups of chips a bit uh, to make room for the reset logic and LEDs. Now for a much trickier part of the routing, let me hook up the result of the step address computation to their corresponding inputs on the multiplexer. Because a lot of the signals have already been partially wired, uh, it's getting much more complicated to do these uh, routing tasks because there's a lot more moving of existing wires involved and notching chips and vias around a bit. And while we're in that corner of the PCB, uh, let me also wire up the reset logic signals. Now there are a lot of uh, ground pins on the uh, chips that aren't yet connected. So let me quickly connect vias to these ground pins that will actually drop down to the bottom layer of the PCB, which is where the ground fill plane will be. The big missing piece now are the PC register chips. Let me try to figure out a way how we can route the signals from and to these chips. It might make sense to move the program counter LEDs more towards the center of the PCB, such that they are out of the way. The bus with the current PC value runs uh, across the PCB horizontally anyway, so it'll be easy to have the LEDs tap off the value from that bus. Alright, so this uh, breakout wiring brings uh, all the uh, inputs of the register to the top and all the outputs of the register to the bottom. But with this breakout wiring done, uh, it looks like we'll have an easier time routing if we rearrange the order of the bits that are stored in the registers such that they are properly in order at the breakout points. Okay, so first up, uh, let me hook up the uh, outputs of the register. And let's wire up the uh, input side of the register. And let's also wire up the uh, PC output header. And then uh, let's do a detailed routing of the PC bus. And in the upper half of the PCB, there's the rel address and PC next buses that still need to be routed. And it looks like these resistors at the top could benefit from uh, reversing the order of the connections. Let's finalize these buses at the top. And let's look for the last few unrouted nets. All right, so we're getting closer. There's uh, no more unrouted nets except for the VCC and uh, ground wires, uh, which we're going to uh, actually implement as a basically a copper pour at the top and the bottom. So we're basically going to fill in all the gaps of the PCB with uh, VDD and ground connections. Uh, one thing that's left to do though is actually distributing the decoupling the capacitors. Um, these should uh, ideally go very close to the existing integrated circuits. So uh, let's do that. Let's distribute these uh, capacitors and then uh, shrink the board and see where we get with the uh, copper fill.
Let me also make sure that um, all the pin headers have a uniform and reasonable uh, drill hole size. Let's do a design rule check to quickly see if we have violated any design rules and we need to fix anything on the PCB. All right, and with the uh, DRC clean, let's move to uh, a few touch-ups. Let me move the uh, open source hardware uh, logo to the bottom side of the uh, PCB and let's tighten up the board outline a bit. And then there's a whole bunch of silkscreen cleanup work to be done. Uh, for example, uh, cleaning up these unnecessary resistor network names. Adding a label to the program counter LEDs. We'll also want a prominent board label somewhere in the center. And then in order to make populating the PCB easier, we'll want to make the names and the type of the chips visible on the silkscreen within the uh, footprint of the chip, uh, such that we can just look at the silk screen and know which chip needs to go where. And let's add a placeholder for the JLC PCB order number, such that they don't put it somewhere where it's visible. Let me also add some documentation to the silk screen to explain how these round down jumpers work and how they're supposed to be uh, connected or left open and what the resulting behavior of the program counter is going to be. On the top layer, let me add a uh, copper pour for VDD and on the bottom a copper pour for ground. And let's improve the connectivity of the, uh, the islands in the copper pour a bit by stitching them together in places where they are um, disconnected or where there's a long path between two islands. Let me also add some bit numberings so we have an easy time telling uh, which side of a header is the most and which one is the least significant bit. And we'll want some labels on the control signals so we have an easier time hooking things up. Now for the big reveal. Let's look at the 3D preview of the PCB. So as a rough overview, on the bottom right, we have the current PC value and the registers holding that current PC value. Then in the lower middle, there's the LEDs indicating the current PC value. And the lower left, there's the address that will compute the step address, which is the next address in the instruction sequence. Then on the top left, all the way in the corner, there's the status LEDs and the reset logic. And then a bit to the right, there's the uh, eight multiplexers that pick uh, which value will be stored in the PC register in the next cycle. So this can be the step address or the relative jump or an absolute jump uh, address provided from the outside. And then uh, in the top right, there's the adder that performs the relative jump. Um, by adding a value or subtracting a value from the current PC uh, state. And then on the far left, there's a header of control wires that we can hook up to control how the PC is supposed to behave. All right, time to send this off to JLC PCB for manufacturing. It's been a couple of days and this arrived in the mail today. So we have a stencil, program counter PCB, and a bunch of small breakout boards. Uh, let's take a look at these. Stencil is gonna help us um, apply solder paste to the program counter PCB. That's gonna be fun.
These look pretty good. And we got five of them, which is pretty handy actually in case we uh, screw something up. And they also help us uh, apply solder paste if we have multiple of the boards. Nice. These are just like small connector boards um, that, that serve as a kind of a breakout um, where we can actually plug the um, program counter on top and we have these uh, small connections come out, uh, which can be useful. And they are V-scored along uh, the lines there, so we should actually be able to just snap them apart and, and break them into like these smaller pieces here. And what do you know? That actually works quite well. It's actually kind of fun breaking these apart. All right, so uh, let me prepare um, the setup here for applying some solder mask to one of these boards and then we'll populate the board with the components and then actually solder this thing up and see if it works. All right, so this is the stencil we're going to work with and which we'll use to apply the uh, solder paste. And it's usually a good idea to give this a good kind of um, uh, wipe uh, with isopropyl alcohol. So any kind of residue from the manufacturing uh, is going to be uh, washed away. So let me do that first. Now we want to apply a solder paste to this board. And what we have to do for that is basically align the stencil on top. So the holes in the stencil uh, perfectly match the uh, pad layout underneath. And that's actually not too hard to do. Um, but it's usually a good idea to add a bunch of boards on the sides. So because the stencil is slightly bigger, um, the stencil actually has somewhere to um, sit on that is the exact same height as the main um, PCB. This also helps you uh, reapply uh, solder paste uh, in case uh, some of the pads uh, are missed. All right, so that's uh, reasonably secured. Now we also want to um, quickly clean off the surface of the uh, PCB. We're going to apply solder mask to, to remove uh, any residue. Again, uh, we'll use some isopropyl alcohol for that. All right, so next step is going to be uh, aligning the stencil to this board here. And for that, let me um, actually use the microscope so we can see what's going on. All right, so if we move this up, it's pretty easy to see because there's uh, this one moment where everything lines up, where suddenly uh, you don't see any blue um, PCB anymore and you only see the kind of metallic pads underneath shine through the holes in the stencil. It looks like we might be ever so slightly off, so let's uh, realign this. So basically there's no rush and usually it pays to try and get this uh, aligned pretty well uh, because that saves you a lot of headache later on. And now if we just tape it at the top, we have basically a uh, flap that we can um, move on and off the underlying PCB. And that makes it easy to uh, do a quick inspection and then kind of fold it back down if we need to reapply more solder paste. Next up, we actually need the uh, solder paste itself. All right, and we'll try to apply the solder paste and then we'll use a spatula to basically um, distribute it across the uh, surface. I think that might just about be all right. So let's uh, take a look. This all looks um, pretty solid. What about that singular opening down here? That looks like we might have missed it. Much better. The rest looks okay. So let's see what happens if we uh, basically open up this uh, stencil flap here. A lot of it looks pretty solid, but there seems to be a spot up here where we have missed a lot of the uh, solar paste on 
the resistor networks. So let's see if we can reapply paste right there. Problem was here. And yeah, sure enough, there's no paste there. Let's see if that helped. Looks pretty okay. So let's remove the uh, stencil up here. All right, and next up on the agenda, um, let me remove the boards uh, around here that we used to stabilize the central board and then we'll actually start populating um, the individual components. All right, so here we go, all ready to uh, populate this board. So usually it pays off to roughly go in, uh, by increasing complexity. So basically starting with uh, small stuff like the um, capacitors and then LEDs, resistors, the resistor networks, and then the larger chips, um, because it's easier to align the small pieces. And if you knock them out of place with a bigger one, it's easy because you uh, can go back and just adjust the capacitor. Whereas if you start with the big components and then you try to squeeze in the caps in between, you might knock over an entire um, integrated circuit. And that's gonna be uh, much more annoying to get uh, back in alignment um, than just a, a small capacitor. All right, let's start with the 10 microfarad caps, uh, which are these ones close to the power rails. So aligning the parts isn't that difficult. Um, you, you can nudge them around a bit and then they usually get to the position where they need to go. But usually you also want to apply some uh, uh, downwards uh, pressure into the board. Um, so the part actually sinks properly into the solder paste um, such that when the solder paste liquefies uh, later on when we heat it up, um, the part actually kind of adheres to, to, to the pad. Uh, what can happen otherwise is that you get these tombstone capacitors where, where one side uh, has better purchase with the pad and then kind of the, um, the surface tension actually make the capacitor stand up because it loses contact of the, of the less properly kind of adhered to pad. And by pushing things down, they can somewhat ensure or can improve your chances of that not happening. Next up, um, the 100 nanofarad capacitors. And these are the, the coupling caps that go next to virtually every integrated circuit we have on the board. Let's start up here. This uh, NAND gate that we have that needs a decoupling cap. And then um, these chips down here. All right, next up, let's move over here. And then finally, these ones up here, maybe flip the board around. All right, so that's all the uh, capacitors done. Next up, we have a few um, loose resistors, um, mainly for the LEDs uh, up in the corner here. All right, so up here in the corner, this is where these resistors need to go. Then we also have two 10K resistors down here. So these go up here, like so. Then we'll probably want to move to um, the LEDs. First, um, the uh, green ones that go up in the corner. Now these LEDs are pretty interesting. As you can see, they have an arrow on the uh, bottom of the case, which is supposed to symbolize the, the triangle in the um, diode symbol. So basically, this indicates the direction of uh, where the, how the current flows. And then on the uh, upper half of the uh, packaging, you can see these like small green 
um, color splotches here on one of the terminals. And this basically indicates the horizontal bar that is um, usually connected to the tip of the triangle in the uh, diode symbol. So these give you a way to tell which way around the part is. And then also if we take a look at the uh, actual paths where we want to um, place this thing, um, there are also these small arrows uh, in the uh, silk screen uh, right in between the paths. And these have to uh, essentially line up with the arrows uh, on the LED itself. Or if you flip it um, upside down, the bar that is marked on the paths has to point to this kind of small protrusion here at the front. Uh, it's basically indicating the tip of the arrow. All right, um, next up we have a whole bunch of red LEDs that need to go um, down here to indicate the current state of the um, program counter. And it's essentially the um, exact same story again. Line up the uh, arrows on the, the package uh, of the LED with the actual arrow on the silk screen just to make sure that things are actually the correct way around. All right, that doesn't look half bad actually. So that's all the uh, LEDs lined up and placed on the board. Then talking about LEDs, um, while we're down here, um, we also have all the resistors for the red LEDs, the 2.2 kilo ohm uh, resistor networks that we need to place. All right, that doesn't look too bad. The hope is that when this uh, when the solder paste liquefies, um, it will basically pull the part closer to the actual pads. So as long as you get the pads uh, pretty closely aligned initially, you get like a uh, an additional bonus alignment through the uh, soldering and the reflowing of the of the solder paste. We also have 10 kilo ohm resistors. I think we have them as 100 kilo ohm on the uh, on the schematic. Um, for this um, resistor networks up here, which basically force the current PC value onto the relative base uh, headers so that when we don't provide a relative jump base from outside the board, uh, we will just use the current uh, program counter value. All right, let's get this placed. So yeah, that's essentially all the passive components uh, placed on the PCB and ready to go. We have the capacitors and the resistors and then actually active components, we have the LEDs. Um, that's all set. So basically what's missing are all the uh, integrated circuits all across the board. So let's get started with the uh, adder chips. All right, and maybe let's uh, start down in the bottom left corner uh, where the step address is calculated. So now here there's a small white dot uh, outside of the, uh, of the actual chip on the silk screen and this indicates pin number one. There's actually two dots, one inside and one outside um, the packaging. Um, and this has to line up with the uh, pin one indicator which is on the actual chip. So if we take a closer look at the actual IC, you can see it's an HC283 chip. And there's this bar up here that indicates which side of the, of the chip is the side that contains pin one. And then also, if you notice here, one of the sides of the packaging is slightly chamfered uh, compared to the other side, which is more or less a, a straight edge. And this indicates that this is the side of the uh, of the packaging that contains pin one. So basically this corner up here is where pin one is. And essentially we'll just use that information to align things so they uh, are placed correctly on the actual PCB. Next up, we have the uh, adders over here. Again, we have to pay attention where pin one is and then make sure the packaging aligns properly. Okay, so next up, uh, we'll look at the multiplexer chips over here and uh, get these placed. I have a whole bunch of them because we are probably going to use quite a few more of these as the build progresses. Again, white dot close to the package indicates pin one. And in fact, uh, these chips have the same mechanism of indicating uh, which side is the side with pin one. There's a bar uh, on the laser engraving 
and there is a chamfered side to the chip. And now if we, uh, if we take a look here at the capacitor, it would have been an absolute nightmare trying to get this capacitor in between these chips after the fact, after we've placed the chips. So it's pretty good to start with the small and easy components first and then kind of like escalate the complexity of what we're placing on, on the PCB. <laughs> All right, and then over here we have the uh, NAND gate, which I have prepared here. Let's do that next. Again, white dot. And then if we take a look at the uh, actual chip, this actually uh, has a slightly different mechanic. This one has the corresponding dot here on the packaging. And basically all that's left is um, the actual register chips over here on the right hand side. And again, looking at the uh, actual package um, that the uh, chip comes in, it has this uh, small little uh, dot here that indicates pin 1. So we just need to line this up with uh, what's on the silk screen. And I think we are all out of components that need to be placed on the PCB. We should be all set. So now is a good time to uh, do a quick checkup to see if all the LEDs are the right way around and all the integrated circuits have pin one actually where you would expect pin one to be uh, because it's extremely difficult to go back in and change this afterwards once you've soldered it. It's possible, but now is an easier time to do the fix if, if it's necessary. So up here, these LEDs are all the right way around. The NAND gate looks good. These multiplexers all look like they're all pointing in the correct direction. And these adders here, the bar is on the side where the dot is. That's perfect. And these LEDs, they're all the same way around and they're all pointing in the correct direction. This looks good because the uh, dot was in the uh, lower left corner. And then here the bar is on the side where the dot is indicating the first pin. That's perfect. So we're all set. Everything is prepared for soldering. So I think it's now time to uh, heat up the uh, hot air gun, which is going to make soldering this uh, pretty straightforward. And um, then we'll uh, give this a shot and try to solder this up and see, uh, see if that works. Time to heat up the board and slowly start uh, soaking the, uh, the solder paste and then basically do the soldering. All right, I think this is pretty much everything all soldered up. Let's do a quick checkup to see if everything is the way we'd expect it to be. This cap here doesn't look uh, like it's properly soldered, so that needs to be reworked. It's better. How about the caps down here? So the chips look pretty good. Slightly misaligned, but I think that's gonna work. Uh, I can check if I can reheat that in a, in a way that it kind of reflows the whole thing and it basically moves to the proper location. Ah, there we go. All right, much better. Caps look quite all right. So these resistor networks look good. No shorts, as far as I can see. Also the LEDs look good. Okay, so let me quickly rework that capacitor down here. 
That looks good. So I think we're all set in terms of the uh, SMD components uh, on the board. And now all that's left is actually soldering up the uh, pin headers here. So we can plug this into a baseboard or a breadboard or something along those lines. A uh, pretty nice way to actually get these things to line up properly is to use the uh, existing boards that we have, but we haven't used. Um, so we can create a stack of them like this. And then if uh, we take the um, actual pin headers here that we want to uh, connect there, we can start to uh, populate them here and then do the soldering. All right, so that's basically our frame where we want to uh, solder. And we just plug this board in. And if we take a look from the side, this is all neatly lined up. We can press it in a bit more. So we have a, an actual snugly fit like so. And then all that's left to do is actually solder up the connectors. All right, I think that should be all the connectors. Time to do a inspection. Yeah, that looks pretty good. There's quite a bit of flux here, so I might want to give that a uh, wipe down with the uh, isopropyl alcohol, so it looks a bit better and cleaner. But now we should be able to just remove it from this uh, uh, scaffolding or this frame with a uh, tool. And there we go. That's the very first PCB of the uh, Superscalar out of order CPU. It's a program counter. And we should be able to plug this into a breadboard or hook it up to the small breakout boards we have uh, for the connections here. And then this should be able to replace uh, the breadboard program counter that we have at the moment. So let me give this a quick cleanup and then we can uh, give it a test and see if it works. All right, so let's see how we can hook up this program counter PCB here uh, with the rest of the system and basically replace the breadboard that we have. I've also prepared these uh, small breakout boards here which are going to make it easier to actually connect to um, the inputs and outputs of the program counter. And for starters, we are only going to use the absolute address input, which is giving us one chum target, the relative offset input, which is giving us the other chum target. And we're going to use the uh, program counter output to basically drive the input signals off our memory. And we have the control signals over here, but we're not using the relative base uh, currently. And we're also not using the step address at the moment. Let me leave these unconnected for the time being. All right. And this all has to go in here. And this will basically replace this middle part here. So let's see how we can make that work. First up, let me reconnect the um, program counter value that we've taken from over here. And that is driving the address inputs of the memory chip. And we are going to take this from the new PCB now. All right, that's that. We'll leave the uh, upper eight bits uh, unconnected for now. Um, these we can uh, bring in uh, later on because the uh, memory here actually has more input addresses. I think it goes up to address line 18 or something. So theoretically, we now have a program counter that can address the entire memory here, but we'll bring that over once we have a better cable here. It's not really urgent at the moment. All right, next up, let's uh, connect the relative chump offset. This is this bundle of white wires down here that we've uh, brought over here. And we're basically feeding them from the upper eight bits of the uh, instruction. But we don't want to use these uh, white loose wires here. So uh, let me actually use one of these uh, ribbon cable kind of things to make the connection. First up, we'll remove the uh, existing connection here. All 
All right, so that's the uh, relative chump offset connector. And then we want to do the same thing for the absolute chump address, uh, which we'll just bring over here. All right, so that's uh, hooked up. We do have a reset wire here that goes down uh, into the corner of the uh, breadboard. Um, this we can bring over to the actual reset input um, that we have here. Or maybe we should just leave it like that for the time being because uh, this requires us to uh, remove the program counter. And furthermore, this uh, clock wire here will have to be a longer wire. And we also have this select wire that we are going to bring over here. I guess it's time to actually remove the program counter breadboard here and uh, move things over so we actually have enough room uh, to get to work and wire this up entirely. This old clock wire can go. Power connection can go. All right, getting closer. Yeah, we really need some DuPont cables, um, which are less rigid to make it easier to actually have these things arranged in a, in a reasonable way. Yes. All right, so this reset line can go here to the reset input. And then we will connect the clock line here to the clock here, like so. Move this over a bit. Then we have um, the select lines here. All right, and um, let's uh, connect the power here. Let me quickly rearrange this so we don't have this knot over here. Then we have the uh, enable line of the program counter that thing was constantly enabled, so pulled low on the breadboard. So we'll do that here as well. Next up, the step size that we had connected to a one. So bit zero is going to be a one. And bit one is going to be a zero. And that's going to give us a step size of two bytes. Then we need some power down here. And now there's one thing left we should consider doing, and that is the um, upper eight bits of the absolute address. Currently, they are not connected to anything, so they will basically contain garbage data whenever we do an absolute chump. And that's going to be a bit difficult to follow because we, whenever we do an absolute chump, we see the upper eight bits of the program counter uh, get filled with random noise, basically. We're not looking at it, so functionally this is going to work, uh, but it's going to be a bit uh, annoying to debug. So let's actually pull all these wires up here low when we're not using them. And we also have this ground pin here, which internally is connected to the ground plane and so to this uh, thing at the top here. So technically we don't need to connect this, um, but just for the sake of uh, having a good ground connection all across the build, let me connect that down here to the ground rail on this lower breadboard. So let's check if we haven't forgotten anything. So VDD and ground is connected to the breadboard up here that is working. We have the relative chump offset connected and the purple line is connected to bit zero and that goes here to the rightmost connector and the rightmost connector in turn is connected to the rightmost so the least significant bit on the uh, uh, immediate part of the of the instruction so that seems to be working then we have the program counter here, uh, which we are connecting to the address inputs. And the white wire here is bit zero, and this is the one we're discarding um, because we're reading two bytes at the same time, but then the other bits are in order. We also have this absolute chump address, which we're bringing up here. Bit zero is the purple wire and that lines up with the other bit zeros here. That's perfect. We're also pulling the uh, upper bits low to ground. So these will all read zero whenever we do an absolute chump, which is perfect. That's exactly what we want. We have a clock wire here that leads to the clock. That's perfect. We have a reset wire that leads to the reset. That's also what we want. 
um, we have the uh, enable line here. Uh, we have it constantly enabled at the moment. That is perfect. The select inputs, these are connected to the least significant bits of the instruction as we have before. Um, then the step size, we have hardwired to a 0, 1. That's giving us a step size of two bytes. That is exactly as we had it before. And then we have the ground connection here just to improve the connectivity of the, of the ground. All right, let me move this to the side a bit so uh, we can actually see what's happening here on the LEDs. So first things first, we might want to pull the enable high and that's gonna mean that the um, program counter is gonna be um, basically just stuck at whatever address it is currently at. And that's gonna allow us to check if the reset is working and if the first um, instruction that comes out of memory is correct. And then we're gonna take our time and check that everything is working. Let me power this up and let's see how that works. All right, nothing's catching fire. That is a good start. However, there seems to be a pretty poor connection to the board down here. Let's see if we can rectify this somehow. Yeah, well, kind of, but uh, we'll, we'll need a better solution for these wires here at some point, but that's gonna work for the time being. All right, so let's see if we can step through the program and make sense what is happening. First up, we have the enable line pulled high, which means uh, the clock genera the, the program counter is disabled, um, but we're in reset mode. So the, um, the program counter is anyway enabled and it's gonna, just gonna load a zero into the uh, program count register, which already is at zero. So it's not gonna do anything in this case. So let me step this out of reset. And as you can see, the enable light has gone uh, off. There's a zero in the program counter and we are actually reading address um, zero and address one here for the 16-bit instruction. And what we're seeing here is uh, the instruction at address zero, which is basically uh, a zero one, zero zero, which is uh, the knob. And if we keep uh, toggling the clock, nothing should happen. Uh, that is the case, nothing happens because the, uh, the program counter is disabled. So as a next step, let me um, pull the enable line low, which is going to enable the program counter. As you can see, the enable light goes on. And now what we should be able to do is actually step through the program. And if I hit the uh, step button once, we should actually jump to address two. And that is exactly what's happening. Uh, we're at address two and we're reading instruction 06 zero one, which is the jump relative at address two. So that's working. Um, and you can also see that the uh, select lines here uh, reflect the least significant bits of the instruction. So select uh, zero is high and select one is low, which indicates a relative jump. Um, so if I hit the step button again, we should actually do a relative jump. We should um, add the value six here to the current program counter address. And this should give us the address eight as a result. And there you go, address eight. And we're reading out address eight. So that seems to be working. Um, let's just hit run and see if this keeps uh, executing the program we already have and keeps looping. Pretty amazing. This is all working as expected. You can see the program is just stepping through the first few uh, addresses and instructions, and it's basically jumping back and forth uh, according to that program we had written. All right, I would say this is the program counter PCB um, successfully integrated into um, the CPU build. And we were able to get rid of um, this whole kind of tangled mess of wires. Um, we've traded them for a few other larger wires here, but these we can get rid of um, and replace them with the smaller kind of DuPont style cables um, that we can also route underneath the boards and, and things will get cleaner a lot. But yeah, this is looking great. So seeing how we now have a uh, program counter PCB and we have 16 uh, instruction bits here, um, and we're only using, I think, 10 of them. So we have six bits uh, left over that, that we're not really using in the instruction. So I think in the next video, I want to take a look at how we can build uh, registers and how we can build an entire register file for this uh, processor and, and maybe already start loading uh, interesting values into these registers and then maybe even move values between registers. Thanks a lot for watching. 
like and subscribe if you want to see more of this and see you next time.